Designing an API is not a trivial task, especially because we cannot predict how our customers will use the API and what are the needs of the product in the future. So we need to be always ready to introduce changes to the API. Hi, if you're new, this is Out of DevOps and my name is Anto. This is a YouTube channel for software engineers. Today, we're gonna talk about backwards and forwards compatibility in API design. So this is another practical tutorial. I created a blog post and a Git repo for uh, supporting this tutorial. So you can find the links down in the description. Now I'm gonna move down in the corner and let's get started. So we want to create an API similar to Twitter where the API receives a payload like this with a username and a tweet. And the API returns then a feed, which is a list of tweets that you can have. So it's a simple API. So what we're gonna do now, I have this implemented in uh, Golang. So as you can see, this is the code. We have our struct with the username and the tweet. And what we do, we expose this on a uh, endpoint slash feed. And when we receive the post, we JSON decode it and we add to our list of tweets and then we return the list of tweets very simple API. So now let's try to run this service and see if it works. So we open a new terminal and what we do is go run main.go. So now we are running version one of our API. Let's open another terminal here. And what we want to do, we want to test the API. So the API is expecting a payload uh, with the username and the tweet. So we're gonna send this as a post. Uh, we pass to JQ just to have a nicer output. We can see a list of tweets that were previously loaded plus our new one, which is this one, right? So now what we want to do, we want to have some sort of um, emulation of a client. And for demo purposes, I created this client emulator. It's written in JavaScript. So this client is calling our API, is posting a new tweet and is expecting an output that contains an array with an object and the object has the properties username and tweet. So let's test this by running npm test. So as we can see, the test is passing, so everything is fine. So now our product is great. We have millions of customers and thousands of developers developing against our API and we want to introduce new features, right? So let's say we want to introduce the hashtag and uh, we need to modify our uh, data structure for uh, the payload that is received in the post and is returned as a list. So I have this already done, so I can uh, switch from this branch to another one. So git checkout v1.1. So now this one, has a different payload. As you can see, now we have an hashtag and we are returning in the, in the list the, the new field. So let's stop and restart the service so we can run on with the new version. Let's go to the other terminal. So I'm gonna terminate this and run it again. So we should see now we are running version 1.1 and we want to make sure that when we run the test, we don't have surprises, so everything is still working. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna run our client emulator and the client emulator is still passing. So even if we added a new field, the call is still the same in the client. So I can show you, we are still doing the same call, passing the same two parameters without passing any hashtag and our response is still valid. So this didn't break because we introduced a non-breaking change. So we made the next version of the API, so the version 1.1 backwards compatible. So generally there are changes that are um, naturally backwards compatible, like adding a new field or adding a new method or adding a new query parameters to our API but there are other changes that are backwards incompatible. So these changes generally are whenever you want to modify the payload and we're gonna see an example in a, in a second, or if you want to modify the response that is returned or a status code or even rename part of the path, all these changes are backwards incompatible. Before we continue, I wanna stop here for a second and talk about what is forward compatibility. So in the previous example, that was an example of an API being backward compatible, 
but we can also have the concept of forward compatibility uh, from an API point of view. So now that we have a change in our API, uh, we should expect that many clients will move from version 1.0 of the API to version 1.1. If they do that, what is going to happen in the case we have to go back to the previous version of the API? So let's assume we go back to version 1. So I do git checkout v 1.0. We're going to stop the service. So we restart the service. Now we're running version 1.0 of the service. The client emulator is still the same. It didn't change between the versions. What we're going to do, let's say this client now becomes compatible with version 1.0 and they're adding the hashtag and we pass something simple as hi okay so now our client emulator is passing an extra field and this is compatible with version 1.1 but now we are testing this against version 1.0 that is running in the background so now if i do npm test what is going to happen is that we have a failure so we have this failure i can show you in the golang code why so in this what we do we have this line here where we disallow unknown fields which means we are strict in the validation of the payload so every single time we receive something that is not conforming with uh, strictly conforming with the structure of our payload uh, the request is rejected so it fails so this is an example of api that is non-forward compatible so um, the API version 1.0 is not forward compatible and in some cases this can uh, can be a problem so now if we want to make forward compatible what we need to do we need to comment this line save then we go back to the terminal we stop our service we run it again and we run the test so now running the test npm test is passing so forward compatibility from an api point of view is often something that is overlooked so in this example by being less strict we are embracing the robustness principle and essentially what we are doing we are being less strict with our uh, payloads that we receive so we accept any kind of uh, payload as long as we have enough information to process the request uh, is fine obviously uh, this is not always a good idea. It depends on uh, your API, on your uh, requirements, and especially from a security point of view. So you, every single time you want to make an API forward compatible, uh, consider the trade-offs. So now let's continue uh, with the tutorial. We were discussing about backward compatibility. Now uh, let's assume we want to introduce a breaking change. So something that will break the clients uh, if applied. So one example can be the rename of a field. Now we want to rename one of the fields. So we were on version 1.1. Let's go back to version 1.1. So now in our version 1.1, we have this tweet field. We don't like it. We want to call it body for some reason. Uh, so now what we can do, we can simply go here, change the name. And what is going to happen is that we're going to break every single client using the API. So let's see how we can now introduce a breaking change without affecting our clients. So we're going to see two different approaches. One is called expanding contract and another one is changing the version of the API. So it's a bump in the version. So let's start with the expanding contract. So instead of bumping the version of the API with the expand and contract, what we can do is we expand our payload by adding a new field without touching the old ones and then at a later stage we decommission the deprecated field so how we can do this uh, let's move to the version 1.2 of the api so as you can see here now we have introduced in our payload another field which is body and we are returning both in uh, in our response and based on what we receive if we receive the body, uh, we set the tweet as well. And if we receive a call from the old API, 
uh, we also set the body so let's go and start the service with the new version so we stop this and we run this now we're running version 1.2 and when we test with our client you're gonna see that it's still passing and as you can see the code is still unchanged we are passing still the same two fields so this is the client designed for version 1.0 of the api and it's still working fine with version 1.2 so what we have done we have introduced this new change uh, which uh, originally was supposed to be a breaking change and we made it compatible with the client designed for the old version of the api so now with this approach of expand and contract we have a second phase which is the contract phase where we are waiting for clients to migrate to the new version and once they are done we can deprecate the old field obviously we have to monitor the api usage to understand when the clients are not using the old version anymore and it's safe for them to remove the the field that is deprecated this approach is encouraged for a private api where it's easier to have control over the clients but most of the time for a public api it's, it's going to be impossible to control the clients so you're going to end up in a worse situation because you may never be able to execute the contract phase and you're going to end up with a service that will have lots of duplication inside so what is the approach to adopt when the expanding contract is not ideal so uh, as we mentioned before, the last one is the version bump. Version bump means um, that we bump the major version of the API. So instead of having v1 dot something, we're going to introduce a new, an entirely new version of the API, which is v2 dot zero, for example. And this API can be reached at a different path. So what we what we are doing, we are essentially having two independent services, even if the versions may live under the same service. We're going to have two independent services serving uh, API 1 and API 2. So there are different approaches to implement the version bump. Uh, the most common ones are path-based versioning or the header-based versioning. In the path-based versioning, what we're going to do, we're going to end up with the version being stated in the path. So we can have different endpoints and based on the endpoints that you hit, you're going to receive response for one API or the other. Uh, the other one instead is the header based versioning so where you have a specific header that can be custom header or a standard header in this example here we have a custom header which is accept version uh, v1 and accepted version v2 or we can go back to the standard header which is accept and we we can specify the version of our API using using this. Even in this case, it's important to monitor the usage of the API, collect statistics about who is using how many clients and when can be decommissioned because uh, it will be ideal to decommission v1 once there are no clients using that anymore. So as you can see, designing API is hard, especially after the first version is out. And so what we can do when we have to introduce a breaking change. Today we have seen how to implement changes, how to introduce breaking changes. The recommended way is not introducing breaking changes. If you cannot do that, try the expand and contract approach first in case you can execute the contract phase or otherwise the only option that you have is bumping the API version. So hope this tutorial was useful. Subscribe for more and comment for uh, questions. You can find all the details in the description down below and see you to the next video. Bye bye.